Hello, I'm Craig and welcome to another episode of Football Kit Memories, the football podcast that gets under the shirt. In today's episode, I'm joined by author and broadcaster Paul John Dykes from the award-winning podcast The Celtic State of Mind. Paul John has recently just published The Celtic Jersey, a beautiful pictorial history of Celtic's famous shirts throughout the ages, a book I really enjoyed reading over Christmas. During the chat, we talk about the process behind putting together such a stunning and comprehensive collection of images and anecdotes with the help of former Celtic player and kit man Neely Mocken's son, other Celtic collectors and the club itself. I also found out more about Paul John's plans for a Celtic state of mind, its live events, and I get his thoughts on the evolving position of fan media itself. Later, and as always, I ask Paul John to pick out his three favourite football shirts. Remember, you can listen to this and other episodes of Football Kit Memories on all major audio platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please do like, follow, share, but above all, please do enjoy the podcast. Okay, so today on the podcast, I'm joined by author, podcaster and broadcaster. It's Paul John Dykes from A Celtic State of Mind. How are you, mate? I'm great, uh, Craig. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you over the last few weeks and we finally got a date in the diary. So it's an absolute pleasure to join you. Oh, mate, I'm amazed um, I'm amazed at how good this book is. I absolutely loved it. So I'm really excited to speak to you about it. I got it here right with me. Um, it's the history of the Celtic jersey. It's called The Celtic Jersey. Um, and it does what it says on the tin. It's a beautiful kind of coffee table book that takes you through the history of the Celtic shirt, both home and away, and some special ones as well, which um, we'll get to in a moment. I just wanted to speak to you first about a Celtic state of mind. And we're just talking off air there. Like I wanted what to call it because it's, you know, it's so much bigger than a podcast. It's a huge piece of kind of Celtic fan media. Do you want to give me a bit of background on it? Yeah, it certainly started off as a podcast. And I think that over the piece, very naturally, Craig, it kind of grew arms and legs. So I had spoken to people like yourself who ran podcasts and I thought to myself, what a great thing this is. I, I wasn't really into the podcasting back in the day. Um, I'm kind of late to the party, I've got to admit. But I realised that there was a brilliant platform there with podcasting to engage with like-minded people on any subject whatsoever. And I had written down uh, the term, a Celtic state of mind. I loved it. I didn't mm. know what it would become. I thought it might have been the title of a future book um, because I'm you know, I'm that type of person. I write everything down in journals and on my phone. Um, so I had the term, I had the name before I had the concept. And okay. then I realised, you know what, if I, if I did a weekly podcast, I could start building up an audience. And that's what it started as. It was a kitchen table podcast. Um, I decided I'm going to do a podcast. I had no idea about recording, editing, uh, graphics, it's one of the ones I just decide to do something and then figure out how to make it work as yeah. I go along. Um, and then the pandemic, uh, I know that everybody's sick of hearing about the pandemic and the lockdown and all this kind of stuff. But we, you just adapted, didn't you? And you're, you're sitting in there thinking, well, I've got to do something a wee bit different. And mm. um, I'd done an interview. I'd never used Zoom. And I'd done an interview and it was on StreamYard. And I thought, wow, this is a brilliant program. Okay. Um, let's start doing Axom via StreamYard. So we had a few guys that were involved and girls and I just thought, let's do this a wee bit more regular. Next thing you know, it's on every single day. It's become a staple part of my day, my yeah. daily routine. And it's a, a case now of expanding that even further. So we've got it on YouTube and all the audio platforms uh, still with the the um, the podcast side of it because people still tune in, be that maybe out running or mm. walking the dog, you know, the commute to work. Um, and then it's just about expanding that and, you know, moving into other forms of media now. I'm, I'm right into creating videos and right. um, I, I did work on a couple of documentaries previously. Uh, one of which is on Amazon Prime Okay. at the moment. But don't pay the price. Just go into YouTube because somebody's uploaded it to YouTube. <laughs> and I'm much, I'm much happier. Just do that because I don't make any money on Prime anyway. Go okay. to YouTube and watch, watch it for free. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed that process. So I want to get in, into that. Even if it's just shorts, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour dives into certain Celtic aspects. Yeah. I want to get more and more into that as well. Wow. So like the, the, the daily broadcasts are like mainly new stuff, right? But you do lots of stuff outside that, like live events and like interviews with kind of former players, managers, et cetera, as well, right? Yeah. The, the broadcast, I, I now liken it to 
you know, Coronation Street or or EastEnders. I've not watched their programmes for years <laughs> uh, because I've been too busy trying to finish this book, right? Yeah. But I, it would still sadden me if they weren't on, right? You want them to be a staple part. It needs to be there, right? And Axe Homes a wee bit like that because we've been doing it now daily for three years. Okay. And it, so the 12.30 broadcast is just that. We'll continue on stream yards until people forget that that's how they live their life through the, mm-hmm. the lockdown. Um, but yeah, other things like interviews. So, um, you know, everybody from a, an ex player to maybe a musician or an actor or, uh, you know, someone who writes books, um, interview them about their Celtic state of mind and get that, that interview done in such a way where it's fully produced and it's, you know, mm. uh, all singing, all dancing. I love doing that kind of thing. And like you say, getting out and about, which, it was a burning ambition during the months where we weren't able to get out and about. And now we're meeting people who listen to Axom and we've got a special guest. So last month it was Brian McClare. Yeah. Uh, this month we've got Tom Boyd and then separately we've got Martin O'Neill, which wow, I can't wow. wait. Can't wait to speak to him. Yeah. Um, and upcoming after that, we've got Danny McGrain and Alan Thompson. So Incredible. eventually once a month, the community together, have a few drinks, have a laugh, meet a Celtic legend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just branching out as much as we can. Wow, I need to get myself up to Glasgow, mate. That sounds amazing. Um, so I, I like how involved with you guys with the club? Like it's the club kind of you know, fan media's become a big thing, definitely at Celtic, I've noticed over the last few years, but I guess across media in general, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I was looking at other clubs and how they embraced fan media. I'm a big fan of the Anfield rap. I think what they guys do is tremendous. Mm. And uh, we've we've collaborated a couple of times with them as well. But what astonishes me is the relationship they've got with Liverpool. You know, yeah. Liverpool have given them access to Jurgen Klopp a number of times. Um, they go on tour with them in the summer and stuff like that. It's brilliant. And I've got to admit, the club have been great um, because up to a certain point, there was a select few who had access to, you know, press conferences and events and stuff like that, Mm. who were beyond the mainstream media. But there was a real sea change and it was just prior to Ange Postacoglu coming to the club. So great timing. Yeah. And the club really embraced fan media. And I've got to say, there are some outstanding uh, platforms out there, podcasts and broadcasts um, from Celtic fans, some brilliant, you know, great minds out there. And it's no surprise to me when someone who has been on Celtic fan media ends up being employed in the mainstream media. Now, that isn't, you know, the key for me because Axom's my baby and I'm not going anywhere. But when someone comes on the show and they contribute and they eventually get a job in the industry that they've qualified for it gets, gives me great satisfaction but also it just shows you the quality of celtic media that's out there yeah that's really interesting do you know one thing i think it's interesting that you say that you just kind of the club invited you guys in just as Ange came to the club uh obviously things are going very well but just prior to that things weren't going so well i wonder if that relationship will change if you know things change in the future at celtic and you know we go through a bad patch or whatever I wonder how that relationship with the club will change for fan media. It'll be interesting to see. It definitely will be. And it's all about the people who make the decisions. I mean, when you look at the timeline, um, at the time that Ange came in, we uh, were under the stewardship of a different CEO. Yeah, uh, P- Peter Lowell had, had stepped down. Um, and then since then, we've actually got a third CEO. Uh, but prior to Don Mackay, we, we didn't have any access whatsoever. Interesting. Um, thankfully, it's continued since uh, Don Mackay left the club. But they, they really did embrace us. But since that's happened, we've not really had much bad times. You're, you're spot on. It will be very interesting when that that time arrives, you know, because you've got to try and, and stay as balanced as possible. Yeah. You don't want it to be a hand in glove scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's obviously certain narratives that we understand the club need to stick to. Uh, we want to be more of a fans platform. Yeah. Um, so with respect, obviously you, you put out your own, your own opinions, um, how that would change if we weren't doing so well, um, Hopefully it's a few years down the line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'll be listeners thinking otherwise, though, so you never know. So, look, you've written three other books on Celtic as well. This isn't your first book. Um, it's the Quality Street Gang, the kind of young group of players that came through after the Lisbon Lions. There's one on Neely Mocken, who will be important, obviously, for the Celtic jersey book as well. And there's one on Andy Lynch, a player I didn't know a lot, uh, went to America. Um, 
is your background in writing or journalism or is it just a hobby that you've kind of created and done something you know you've done so well with it it was a hobby it was just a hobby um it, it didn't although my my working life did involve writing and research and interviews. Mm. Um, in terms of journalism, I have no journalism uh, journalistic background, um, but I always had ambitions in terms of writing, and I did a lot of writing uh, after leaving the school, even when I was working full time. Uh, but mainly based uh, in the world of music. Now I'm going to have to confess. The reason I did it was so that I could get free tickets to gigs <laughs> and uh, free music because okay. back in the day, they used to send the music out physically. Wow. And I used to love getting all these free CDs and all these promos, right? Um, and all you had to do was write three or 400 words and, you know, you <laughs> kept getting them. So it was it was a bit sneaky, but at the end of the day, they got what they wanted and I got what I wanted. So yeah. um, the, the thing with that, though, in, in order to write something more tangible and something more long standing, I had to know more about the subject. I'm a, I'm a massive music fan, mm. but I'm not a musician and I'm not for a minute saying I'm a footballer, but I understood the technicalities of football. Yeah. Um, like everybody else, you know, from my era and hopefully from the eras to come, I played football since the, you know, the day I could walk right up to the day that uh, you realize you're not going to make it. And yeah. so the football side of things, I felt that I understand the mechanics a wee bit better. And obviously Celtic being uh, an obsession of mine since I was very, very young, um, people probably thought I was a bit of an anorak from a young age because I wanted every book that was ever released on Celtic. And my birthday is in December. So at December time, birthdays and Christmases, it was always what Celtic books were out. Right. And then it got to the point where, I used to ask my mum just to rake through second-hand shops and get me old football annuals. I was oh, wow. absolutely obsessed with football history. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't just the here and now, because growing up in the 80s and the 90s, football generally wasn't as sexy as it is now. It wasn't yeah. something that was trendy, you know? Um, and I always remember this. When I was going to the games, me and my old fella uh, on the supporters' buses, when I went to school on the Monday morning, I was the only person in that school bus, a double-decker school bus, who had been to the Celtic really? game at the weekend, 100%. Wow. And I know a lot of people now would like to revise history on that and say <laughs> that they used to go. No, yeah. they didn't. <laughs> Absolutely no chance did they go. Um, so the football thing was always an obsession. And then uh, one of the players that I had a, a particular interest in was George Conley, who okay. was one of the Quality Street kids. Mm. And the reason for that was we came from the same locality, um, his family worked with my dad in the pits, that kind of thing. So there was this whole mystique around George whereby he quit the game at the age of 26 when he was at the peak of his powers. Yeah. And there was all these different theories around it, you know. And But what certainly remained was this mystique about George. And I always remember, for example, my mum would maybe come in one night and say, oh, I saw George Conley and... Uh, th but you never ever seen him. Yeah, there was yeah. this mystique around this yeah. guy. And I always just had this ambition to um, speak to him, interview him, maybe even write a book about him at some point. So that's where the, the you know, the, the uh, cog started uh, uh, working in my mind. Right. But I, what I also used to do is I used to write to people and ask for interviews. Okay. And um, th this, this came to mind fairly recently. I'm at maybe second year at high school. And there was a guy who I knew lived locally and he managed Cowden Beath Football Club, right, at the right. time. And I live in Fife, so they were one of my local sides. Right. Um, but he was a member of the great Dundee United team of the early 80s. Mm. John Riley was his name. So I wrote and said, can I interview you? And but bizarrely enough, and much to his credit, obviously because it was a handwritten letter back then, yeah. he knocked on my door one night. He just chapped my door one night and says, "I is is Paul John there?" And wow. he comes and he sat. My mum made him a cup of tea and all that, and he sat and I interviewed him for about two hours. It, he was unbelievable, and it gave me a sense of, "Wow, I can do this." Yeah, it took me a long, long time to put it into action, but you know that we think he probably has no idea who I am. Yeah, um, I don't even know if he remembers it, but to give me the time of day back then he was at the beginning of his managerial career yeah. and he gave me a couple of hours of his time um i felt that you know what i could send later on i could send an email and feel no fear uh, because you know people might want to give you their time yeah um but he definitely uh, set that up in my own mind gave me a bit of confidence so i'm eternally grateful for him i've never met him since i would like yeah. to say thank you but you need to write him another letter yeah definitely <laughs> i'd love to i'd love to say thank you to him yeah that's incredible
So look, Paul John, this latest book, The Celtic Jersey, um, I read it over Christmas, as I said. It, I, I remember reading that it had been a real labour of love for you to kind of put all this information together. Like, when did you start the book and how did the initial concept come about? It's a, a long a long kind of project because I started it in 2015, oh, believe wow. it or not. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what happened was I was in Spain and I was working on Andy Lynch's book. Mm-hmm. And I had this idea in my mind, and it came from a few different um, sources. So the first one was the fact that I'd already finished Neely Mawkins' book. Yeah. Neely, as you quite rightly said, legend of the club. But what he had done as a kit man is he had kept loads of Celtic kits. And he'd also kept everything else. So there was medals, kits, manager's jackets, football yeah. boots, whistles, all position jerseys, everything you can imagine, like museum-worthy collection. Yeah. And I got to know his son through, um, obviously, writing the Neely Mawkins book. And, and young Neely is still a pal of mine. Mm. So the idea and the concept was there. Because I said, you know, having seen his collection, this has to be captured, documented. It is an amazing collection, thought to be the biggest in the world, Celtic collection right. in the world. Let's get it done. Um, and then it grew from there and it grew arms and legs from there. And with every book I've ever done, I start it off with no publishing contract, no publisher behind me. I just start it. And I and I love that because you're doing it from the correct place. You know, it's a creative sense. You're not chasing money. You're not having to meet deadlines. I just want to do the project and I want to do it justice. But the project itself took seven years So seven years prior to that release there in December is when I started it. And it was a process of doing Neely's collection first. And at that point, I'm putting a a few wee pictures up on Twitter, it was. And um, Simon Shakeshaft, who had done the Arsenal equivalent, he saw the pictures, he DM'd me, he said, by the way, I think my publisher would be interested in this book. And they were. And at that point, it became more of a, not um, a project as such or a hobby. It became more of a, a an issue with regards to deadline days and all that because I was working right. full time at the time. So it was difficult. And then it was a case of, right, we're going to try and get every jersey. So nearly uh, sadly passed away in 94. So th- right. the next part of the project, part two of the project, was to try and get the jerseys from 94 right up to, to now. Yeah. And, and so I had to then try and figure out who collects Celtic jerseys. You know, um, and then I, I I had the great pleasure of meeting maybe half a dozen collectors, right? Um, who you know their dedication to their their hobby is unbelievable, um, financially and emotionally and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they gave me access to their collections. We were able to then fill in all the gaps, um, and then I'm going to have to mention it again. But the pandemic threw a wee span on the works because. It was hard to get match worn jerseys from that campaign, right? Because okay. nobody was swapping jerseys for oh, obvious reasons. Interesting. Um, yeah, and that's when the club came and kind of like saved my bacon. So all the Adidas jerseys in there came from Celtic. Right. So I'm I'm grateful to the club as well. I think I like the book. It's so much more than just like you know the the images of the shirts and the collections that you put together. Well, that's laid out absolutely beautifully. I think it's amazing how it tracks the history of the club with it as well. And the, you know, the shirts, this visual piece that you've got with that. I think, I mean, there's a few things that just really blew my mind in it, but I mean, the first thing was the story nearly mocking, like the, the Celtic player. And he just had this cupboard of just shirts from years and years past. And nobody had really kind of engaged with them or thought about them. It blows my mind that the club doesn't have a museum with all this stuff in it. I know, I know. And you know the thing with Neely, I'm not quite sure to this day if he had an incredible foresight to mm. keep a hold of everything um, or if he was just a, a terrible hoarder, yeah. which my wife would tell you I'm the same. <laughs> but he kept he kept everything. And no one at the club, like you say, no one at the club thought, oh, we really should have, you know, the whole history. And there were so many occasions where that could have started. So in the centenary year, for example, there was loads of big... Um, events happening around the club. There was yeah. an exhibition, for example, and it was a walk down the history of Celtic. There was an exhibition. At that point, someone maybe should have had a light bulb moment and said, oh, by the way, it was so popular. Maybe we should have a museum up at Celtic Park. Yeah. And even when you go for the tour, which is great, and some of the tour guides are unbelievable in terms of their Celtic knowledge, um, there, there are some little cabinets along the way, but there isn't a museum as such. Mm. Um, and there's been plans over the years, and Neely's already said to the club, young Neely said, listen, 
if and when that museum happens, my collection can be housed in the museum. Yeah. Um, so it would be an incredible experience for people. And I, I did have plans, big grand plans, that when I launched the book, I would have some kind of exhibition. Right. I've not written that off yet. I think the, the collectors and Neely uh, might be quite res receptive to having some kind of event or even a series of events where it's almost like an exhibition, you know, yeah. um, and do something for charity that way as well. But yeah, Neely, the, the book, you know, I never dedicated the book to anyone, but if it was going to be dedicated to anyone, it should have been Neely Mocking because what he did uh, was unbelievable for the history of Celtic. Yeah. I mean, there's a, great, there's a great story. We signed a player called Andy Walker in 1987 uh, from Motherwell and he was told to go and see Neely because Neely looked after all the kit including the football boots he had to go and get a you know not many players had football boot deals back yeah, then yeah, yeah. so he goes to Neely and he asks for a new pair of boots and eventually Neely allows him a new pair of boots but from one of those cupboards that you mentioned he pulls out a you know, a box that had never been opened. It was an Adidas box. And when he opens them, they were a pair of World Cup 1982. So they'd been in the they'd been in that cupboard in their box for five years. Yeah. And he hands them to Andy. That that was the kind of processes that nearly worked under. Wow. Um, I've got a lot of I've got a lot of respect for the man. Yeah, that's incredible. Do you know I had um Pat Nevin on the podcast um when he's promoting his book and he was telling me that he was at Celtic Boys, wasn't he? He was telling me that mm -hmm. um they would get all the kind of old hand me downs from the first team. That's something that you mentioned in the book as well. But he was telling me like he's pulling out a pair of shorts with a seven on there, Jimmy Johnston's shorts and stuff. It's just absolutely yeah. incredible, isn't it? Just how can that just be in a it box is. and not, you know, not thought about kind of thing to be worth so much money these days is incredible. It is. It's a bit sad as well. I mean, obviously, uh, all the younger teams, the reserve team, first hand-me-downs and it went down and down and down. Mm. And of, often what would happen, uh, young nearly told me that often uh, his dad would make sure that, you know, uh, schools and stuff like that would get football jerseys. So a lot of the jerseys were given away. That's, mm. that's a big thing as well. And some of the missing jerseys, I'm convinced that people will have them and have no idea that they're Celtic shirts because yeah, yeah. there's no crest. In fact, some of them don't even have the Umbro logo on, on the jersey, just yeah. on the label. And, you know, they're quite generic. Uh, one of them's a black and green striped jersey. You know, Coventry had the same jersey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of them's just a yellow with a, a green collar. So these, these jerseys that I couldn't get, and for some reason they were missing from Neely's clicks, he probably gave them away. Yeah. Um, They'll be out there somewhere. And I hope that when people look at the book and they're like, oh, wow, I've got one of them in a the loft, they might dig it out yeah. and it might be in a future edition of the book, you know? Coming up, Paul John shares his football kit memories. So look, Paul John, this must have been a hard, hard one for you. Everybody that comes on the podcast, they have to pick out three football shirts to talk about. Um, how difficult was that choice for you? It was hugely difficult. Mm. I think the thing is, you've got favourites. I've got favourite football jerseys. Um, I love things like, these are not in the, the list of three, I love things like the St Etienne of the 1980s, Lecoq Sportif jerseys. Yeah, Beautiful yeah. works of art. Um, and there's, it's brilliant now that um, all these retro companies are are probably on the fly, getting them made somewhere mm -hmm. in a factory and, and selling them because otherwise you just can't get your hands on these jerseys. And I love the NASL shirts. And that was something that um, Andy Lynch and I spoke about when I was doing Andy's book. Right. Andy, as you said, he went over and did the whole American dream thing at the end of his career. And that was at the time when the NASL was was a big, you know, box office event. But the jerseys were kind of ahead of their time. So they had, you know, squad names and numbers um, 30 years before they arrived in the English Premier League, you know, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. There was a certain team who had tassels, right? I'm not quite sure about that, but they had tassels yeah, on yeah. their top. Um, and they were all about big, loud logos and all that kind of stuff. So I loved all that. Um, Orlando Lions and, you know, the New York Cosmos and all these team, mm. it teams. Philadelphia Fury. You know, this is <laughs> even the names of the teams. Um, and then as a kid, as I said, I was obsessed with football. So as well as the books and the annuals, I used to pick up every single week the Celtic View, the Shoot, the Match and Roy the Rovers. Every week. Wow, everything. I mean, God. Every one of them. Yeah. And by the way, I, I never ever paid my mum back for that 15 <laughs> years backlog. But every now and again, like Gary Lineker signs for Barcelona. 
and you would see that the Barcelona kit makers weren't bucked to Umbro or Adidas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it was Maba and it was just this continental kind of vibe. And you loved that because you're thinking, how did I get a Barcelona jersey? Mm. And you'd maybe see, there was maybe a feature on, say, Liam Brady playing for Juventus and he's wearing a Kappa shirt. Mm. You know, it just, I loved all that kind of stuff. Joe Jordan playing for AC Milan wearing an Aneri shirt, an Italian mm. brand. So I've always loved jerseys and I could have used any of them. I've got to concede, I loved the Bokta jersey that Hibs wore when they had uh, George Best playing for them okay. in the late 70s. I loved that. And things like Cardiff City, when they were sponsored by the Super Furry Animals, one of my favourite bands. <laughs> um, and then moving forward, none of these are in my top three, by the okay. way. Moving forward, Kappa, when they'd done Man City jerseys, when Oasis were basically the biggest band in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're on the front cover of the NME wearing the Kappa uh, or it's in fact, I think they wore the Umbro, but then there was a rumour when uh, Man City had the Kappa jerseys that Oasis were going to sponsor them. Wow. You know, and they were the biggest band in the world. I loved all that stuff. Yeah. But yeah, very difficult, but I have narrowed it down to three jerseys. Okay, okay. Well, talk to me. What's the first one? The first one is my favourite Celtic jersey of all time. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get an opportunity to mention this in the book, but it's the Celtic Centenary home shirt. Okay. Um, it's an Umbro jersey. It is a template, which is unusual uh, for it to be my favourite because I like things that are a bit unique, but it is a template because other than the hoops, Aberdeen had the same template. Sheffield United had the same template. You know, it was that. a wee okay. button-down collar. Yeah. Um, we had the green and white hoops, Aberdeen obviously with the red. Mm. Even Rangers had the same shirt, believe it or not. Okay. Wow, I, um, I need to look that up. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of clubs... Um, on Umbro at the time had the same jersey but obviously the colour schemes and all that were, were different yeah. but the Celtic Centenary shirt I loved it it, it was kind of harking back to the olden days with the old style kind of you know button down neck yeah. uh, which was for you know it was appropriate at the time because it was our centenary year um, and I think the reason it's so as well as being a beautiful design it was so um, I was so fond of it was that was the season I actually started going to the games right, right. so it, it wasn't my first Celtic jersey um, but it was definitely the one that you know there was a special kind of element about that season I yeah. was able to go to the games I actually for the first time experienced all that um, and I remember getting the jersey one day before it was released because my dad worked with somebody who had a sports shop. Okay. And he came he came back um, one day before it was released. He came back from a, a night shift and he gave me and my brother the Celtic Centenary shirt to wear at yeah. school. Wow, and we walked wow. into school, wear it. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> and I, I've loved it ever since. And, you know, my frustration being an absolute anorak of football shirts at the time, I always used to love the long sleeves. You know, Frank McIverney always wore the long sleeves, mm -hmm. but you couldn't buy them back then. There was no replica long sleeve market. Okay. Um, so when doing the, the book to come into contact with the, the real deal that were long sleeves with embroidered badges and heavier material, I loved all that. So that, that's my first one. And that, of course, is in the book. Yeah. Um, that is in the book. Um, my second jersey was probably the first World Cup that I was obsessed with. Now, I remember Mexico 86. I remember it. But I wasn't that invested in it. I could have taken or, leave, or left it. But Italia 90 was the World Cup, again, that I just thought, wow, you know, all this continental football, all these... Um, sexy sounding footballers like Salvatore Scalacci and yeah. Roberto Baggio I loved all that stuff but um, Scotland got knocked out as they always do uh, before the groups uh, before the, the knockout stages um, mm. and of course with my background and um, my own family kind of heritage and traditions I support Ireland um, right oh, up right. until okay. they got knocked out in, you know, against Italy um, and the Ireland jersey was unbelievable in that tournament home and away very very simple it was adidas mm. um they had a sponsor which was opal yeah um and the green home with the three adidas stripes and the trefoil on it it was a beautiful simple shirt and the away one was exactly the same although it was white with all the green trims it was just mm -hmm. simplistic it was a thing of beauty and i remember my mum going over to ireland it was some kind of uh, local chapel event where they would go over to Ireland once a year. And she came back and she had bought me the home jersey and she had actually bought my dad the home jersey as well. Okay. Uh, so he was a Celtic da back in the day before it was... <laughs> 
before it was unfashionable. <laughs> um, and, and we both had these jerseys, and I love them. And when you see them now, uh, like on eBay, etc., even the replicas go for several hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they're beautiful, beautiful jerseys. Um, and the third one's a wee bit interesting, a wee bit more interesting, like because it's got a quirkiness about it. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea that it was going to happen. I'm a, as I said before, I'm a huge music fan and I love Primal Scream, right? Mm-hmm. So Primal Scream, their lead singer and also their guitarist are big Celtic fans, unapologetically Celtic fans. Yeah. And um, there's a wee story attached to this. So we played Lazio a few years back in the Europa League mm-hmm. and we actually beat them home and away. And it was the first time a Celtic side in Europe had beaten uh, aside on Italian soil incredible right. uh, we beat Lazio and I was at that game and this was just a strange set of circumstances I was at that game with the guitarist from Primal Scream wow he was he was a, a man called Andrew Innes right yeah uh, and there's a long long story that I won't bore you with but anyway I had a spare ticket and that spare ticket went to Andrew Innes and when we won the game at Celtic Park I'm jumping about with Andrew Innes, who's one of my musical heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, unbelievable night, just a bizarre night, to be honest with you, right? Yeah. And um, so there is a, a point to this. So Primal Scream and Bobby Gillespie in particular were involved in designing a football jersey. And it was for Ada Celtic. So anyone out there who are not familiar with them, it's A-I-D-A. Check it out, Ada Celtic. Mm-hmm. And they raise awareness for Palestine's, uh, the Palestinians' fight uh, against oppression, which obviously is close to Celtic's hearts because, you know, we were born of oppression. Um, you know, course, yeah. the Irish potato famine and, and the diaspora coming over to Glasgow 40 years later, they were still struggling to make ends meet and they were still struggling to be accepted into Scottish society. Mm. So, you know, a football club was formed to support these people. Um, so there was a, a collaboration between Primal Scream, Ada Celtic, and they're sponsored by Anon, and it was called Palestina Delica. And it was modelled <laughs> by none other than Eric Cantona. Wow. So Google Eric Cantona, um, Ada Celtic. The jersey is a thing of beauty. It is as rare as any of the jerseys in my book. You cannot find one of these. They sold out long before they were even put on sale kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the, the political aspect of that, the fact that it was, uh, you know, for charitable purposes to raise awareness uh, for an oppressed people, I think that pulls the heartstrings of a Celtic fan uh, yeah. who knows the history, you know. Uh, and the fact that you've got Eric Cantona and Bobby Gillespie involved, need I say more? Fantastic. Well, mate, that is three amazing choices. Thank you for sharing your football kit memories with me. Absolutely brilliant. Um, where can people find the book? The book is available directly from the publisher. And the reason I say that is because they are an independent publisher, SP Vision. And if you buy direct from the publisher, it's like everything else. The vast majority of your money goes directly to the publisher. Um, it's also available in Waterstones and various other bookshops. Um, it's available in the Celtic shop. Um, on match day if you want to pick it up I'll tell you what it's, it's a fair old volume so you might want to get boy, it on the way out it? of yeah. the state <laughs> it yeah, is, big old boy. It is, it's a heavy one so if you've got a bag fair enough um, and you can buy it on Amazon as well the, the reason I don't promote Amazon first is you know I'm not knocking them you get loads of sales to Amazon but they take a huge chunk from the publisher Right. Um, so if you want to buy independent uh, or if you want to support Celtic first of all buy it from the Celtic shop mm-hmm. if you want to support the publisher buy it directly from the publisher Fantastic. And where can people find you guys on um, social? Yeah, we're on all the socials. Um, I mean, even ones that I don't understand, like uh, TikTok. <laughs> TikTok. I mean, listen, I haven't even started Instagram yet. How anybody expects me to be on TikTok, I'll never know. But um, a Celtic state of mind or a state of mind are on all the platforms. So, And I've got personal pages on Facebook and Twitter. Right. I haven't managed to get onto the any of the others yet. I'm just still getting my head around those two. Um, but a Celtic state of mind, a state of mind or myself, You'll find us on the socials um, and I love hearing from people. So it's great to get uh, good feedback from yourself and I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, some of the pictures I was getting at Christmas time, people getting it for Christmas, yeah, yeah. I, I blew me away because as a Celtic fan, back in the day, that was my big thing. I used to love getting Celtic books and the fact that my name's on the books that people are now receiving sometimes blows my mind, you know? Yeah. So I love people getting in touch, tuning into the show. And the thing is, people who buy the book might 
buy it because they like a Celtic state of mind. People who buy the book might be introduced to a Celtic state of mind. So the whole thing feeds in and hopefully we can continue to build this community of people with a, a similar state of mind. Fantastic, mate. Well, look, thanks a lot for joining me and best of luck with the book and best of luck with the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, mate. So there you have it. Massive thanks to Paul John for sharing his football kit memories with me. Remember, you can follow me on Instagram or get in touch via Twitter or email. You can pick up the Celtic jersey direct from Vision Sports Publishing or indeed from the club itself. Make sure you follow Paul John and a Celtic State of Mind on YouTube and all the socials as well. The music you heard was produced by Eva Led. You can check out his music on his Bandcamp page. There's links to absolutely everything I mentioned there in the notes section of the podcast too. And finally, thanks to you for listening. If you have enjoyed it, please do spread the word. Give me a follow on social and subscribe to Football Kit Memories on your podcast player of choice. Sharing is caring. And other than that, I guess that's it. So until next time, I'll catch you later.